I thought we'd start off by introducing ourselves and then I'll introduce Zoltan. I'm Stephen Berkeley. I'm vice chairman of the Oxford Centre for the Study of Philanthropy. Until th Wednesday, I'm a fellow of Green Tumbleton when I become an honorary fellow uh, and have been involved with Templeton and Green Tumbleton for 25 years. <coughs> and I've also been involved with the LSE. We'll come on to that later. That's how I met Zoltan. The seminar is entitled, What is Philanthropy and Why Does It Matter in the 21st Century? Professor Zoltan Axe will lead us into this. Zoltan is a young guy, because I'm older than him, so anyone younger than me is a young guy, uh, <coughs> and is an economist by background. I met him because I'm also involved with the LSE, and we were starting a centre or an institute for entrepreneurial studies, and he was uh, recruited to run it, uh, and I was asked to meet with him. <coughs> and we met with one July afternoon on a day like this, and he started telling me about his new book called Why Philanthropy Matters. And it <coughs> engaged, I got very engaged in this, he gave me a copy and I read it and I got my friend and colleague Michael Earl to read it and Michael said, you know, I been was Pro Vice Chancellor of Development at Oxford University and met a lot of philanthropists and I understand why philanthropy matters but there's very little done academically. Why don't we start a centre for the study of philanthropy at Green Templeton College? And we had some talks with Zoltan and so Zoltan's really responsible why we're here today. So thank you, Zoltan. You're very welcome. Uh, Zoltan it likes to raise issues, pose issues on entrepreneurship, on philanthropy, on the capital system. He's a sort of alternate to Piketty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he is going to hope this afternoon take us through the various alternatives and options there are, where he thinks philanthropy is going, the moral capital of philanthropy, and maybe we can look at the social responsibility of philanthropy when people are putting their names on buildings and things like that. So Zoltan, why don't you start off in your normal style? <laughs> well, thank you, Stephen, for that. <laughs> kind introduction and thank you all for coming. It's nice to see you all here and um, it's nice to be here at the second seminar that Charles has put together. Um, I look forward to more of these. Let me start out with a little question. What does 20th, 21st century capitalism look like? Let me suggest that the world today sits on a knife edge. It could either descend into 20th century socialism or into a 21st century nightmare of war, greed, and inequality. We hear these every day. Philanthropy matters in this debate as I sort of lay out in my book. Why does philanthropy matter? Because moral capital over the centuries strengthens both capitalism and democracy by investing in opportunity and social justice. Right? It fought against slavery for women's suffrage civil rights, gay rights today, which in turn leads to long-term economic growth, greater equality, and continued entrepreneurship. So moral capital represents the missing link in the theory of economic development.
By the end of the 20th century, socialism had collapsed and we thought was gone. The system simply could not keep pace with the economic output of its competitors. Capitalism has had a fresh start. Socialism had been relegated to the dustbin of history. And democracy is flourishing in a majority of countries around the world. The fall of the Berlin Wall as interpreted by Fukuyama, had driven the final nail into the 20th century view of capitalism, Schumpeter's capitalism, socialism, and democracy. However, no new blueprint emerged along the lines of Schumpeter's work for what the 20th first century would look like. What would a blueprint look like? Part of the answer is to be found in Alex Tocqueville's work, who wrote that while socialism and democracy appeal to our better side, socialism is about equality via servitude and restraint, whereas democracy seeks equality of opportunity. For all and promotes democracy. Schumpeter, as we know, was wrong in his prognosis about capitalism. Right? And he was wrong, I believe, because he missed the essential aspect of capitalism. The answer to the turnaround is to be found, I believe, in the role giving plays in promoting equality of opportunity in the capitalist system, especially in the United States. Through philanthropy, private individuals create public goods, rather than relying on the state to do it all. Philanthropy gives legitimacy to the bourgeoisie by reconstituting private wealth to create public goods. Schumpeter and many others missed the importance of this great 19th century invention, the redirection of capital from private ends to public goods including the private creation of public goods, in short, philanthropy. The evidence for this reconstitution is to be found in the writings of Oliver Zeus, among others. According to Zunes, American philanthropy today expands knowledge, champions social movements, defines active citizenship, influences policymakers, and addresses humanitarian crises. How did philanthropy become such a powerful and integral force in American society? At the heart of this drama is the entrepreneur who sets the capitalist system in motion through innovation and then uses his or her wealth and skill for the public good. This bilateral relationship between entrepreneurs and institutions is the hallmark of capitalism. Our institutions determine the type of entrepreneurship we will have, just as entrepreneurs determine the type of institutions we will have in the future. Therefore, the tension in advanced capitalism is not between winners and losers who have to be sorted out by creative destruction. So Uber destroys your job of drivers who had been licensed cab drivers in the past. But between enabling the creation of vast wealth by those who innovate and protecting opportunity for those who do not. Philanthropy has the potential to mitigate inequality as it softens the hard edges of the free market. Recycling wealth reduces income inequality and contributes to a more just and prosperous society. So the issue is, what are the options for wealth? And there are three. Keep it, tax it, or give it away. Everything falls into one of those three buckets. If you leave only money to the next generation, you leave them poor. They will squander it. This was true in the past, and it's still true today in many different parts of the world. Cornelius Vanderbilt built a great fortune in the 1800s. 
He left it to his seven sons, and over the years, all of it was squandered and wasted. In 1970, 120 of his descendants met. There wasn't one millionaire in the group. Today, we are starting to return to a world where wealth is used to create a better future for all. Michael Bloomberg, mayor of New York, and founders of the Bloomberg News, wrote in his giving pledge letter, if you want to fully enjoy life, give. And if you want to do something for your children and show how much you love them, the single best thing by far is to support organizations that will create a better world for them and their children. In the 21st century, the world is returning to its 19th century roots of liberal democracy and capitalism is flourishing around the globe. However, the world has not yet come to understand and appreciate the fact that these two forces, capitalism and democracy, cannot survive and prosper without philanthropy. While capitalism is a cultural phenomena and democracy has institutional underpinnings, philanthropy is a natural force that has existed in all societies and has taken different forms historically. Aristotle wrote over 2,000 years ago, I was really happy to find this quote, to give away money is an easy matter and it is in every man's power, but to decide whom to give it and how much and when and for what purpose and how is neither in every man's power nor an easy matter. And that was as true 2,000 years ago as it is today. Nevertheless, we need to look after each other as part of our DNA. In this debate, we need to understand the dynamics of socioeconomic formations and recognize that philanthropy matters because it offers an alternative solution and here's your cue to the Piketty conundrum without relying exclusively on a wealth tax on the rich. How and why is wealth con reconstituted through philanthropy? Because many do not understand the function of giving. They dismiss moral capital, define it as, defined as the resources that sustain a moral community, and many view it as a hoax. However, the art of putting wealth to work for the common good is, in fact, a capitalist venture for social betterment. This is distinctly different from the acts of kindness or the great society or helping the poor in Victorian England, which were not philanthropy but a form of charity. Why this crucial distinction? Because when moral capital is absent, Wealth remains concentrated, rent-seeking flourishes, and innovation, entrepreneurship, and democracy suffer. So let me then take that introduction and really do three things. I'd like to run through to sort of give us a common base to think about capitalism through Schumpeter's work then I would like to replace in that socialism with philanthropy. And then I'll talk a little bit about the ecosystem of moral capital, and then I'll run through a few numbers on what this looks like. Capitalism, socialism, and democracy sits midway between Marxist capital, 1851, and Piketty's capital in the 21st century, 2014. Published in 1942 as World War II raged, the bestseller fed into a growing debate about economics, specifically the long-run evolution of capitalism, inequality, the concentration of wealth, specifically. Um, although the news was filled with reports of the battles of Stalingrad and Midway, the world was also looking ahead to what the world would look like when the bomb stopped falling. <clears throat> in Capitalism and Socialism Democracy, Schumpeter provided a 
chilling and sober account of the great debate facing the world. Right? He asked three questions. The first one was, can capitalism survive? And he responded, I do not think so. Right? Second, he said, can socialism work? And he said, of course. And finally, the question, will socialism be democratic? Right? And here he punted. In other words, he was hopeful that socialism would be democratic, as were lots of people, but was unsure of the final outcome. Schumpeter turned out to be wrong on all counts. Capitalism, in fact, did survive and has flourished and flourished a lot recently. Um, socialism turned out not to be able to work, basically because innovation and entrepreneurship were eliminated. And it turned out to be authoritarian and undemocratic. Right. So let's start out by explaining precisely what we mean by capitalism, right? And then examine why Schumpeter did not believe it would survive. Right. Capitalism, or bourgeois society, is a cultural phenomenon that arose out of the success of business. Entrepreneurs, industrialists are not born into the bourgeoisie like the feudal lords, right? Its foundation is economic. Cement, steel, glass, all consist of an economic model. Right? The entire focus of bourgeoisie society is on the economic side of life, and success is measured in terms of money. Capitalist society is defined by an institutional pattern in which elements are the key, uh, uh, the three elements of this key importance are private property, regulation of production through contracts, and finance. In this world, economic decisions are made in the privately owned and privately managed firm that lead to the accumulation of capital. Right. Advanced capitalism, right, therefore, is an evolutionary process in which the system relies on entrepreneurs and innovation. Evolutionary refers to the fact that the system is constantly changing as entrepreneurs create new firms and kill other things. They kill firms, they kill products, they kill processes, jobs, and the system never rests. New technologies and innovation created by entrepreneurs are what keep the engine going. Just think of what happened to the typewriter, the telephone, even television. This process of change revolutionizes the economic structure from within, continually breaking down the old models and creating new ones. Right, this process of creative destruction, as Schumpeter wrote, is the essential fact about capitalism. It is what capitalists consist of and what every capitalist concern has got to live with. This evolutionary process is not about how entrepreneurs administer existing organizations, but in how they build and destroy them. However, at this point, in the not too distant fusion, future, this process of change could come to an end. If all needs are met and no new needs arise, while at the same time production has achieved the state of perfection, economic growth would come to a halt in a stagnant state with no growth would ensure. There would be nothing left for entrepreneurs to do and capitalism could not survive. Right. And if we think back to the 1930s, there was a large and ongoing debate among economists and others that indeed we had reached a state where the clothes washer, radio, industrial processes would create a world where we could not imagine of creating things that we would still want. And therefore, the question was, what will we do with all our leisure time? and what would that world look like? Um, right, let us next turn to socialism. Right? A socialist society refers to one with an institutional pattern whereby control over the means of production right, and production itself is vested with a central authority. In other words, the economics of society belong to the public 
rather than the private sphere. A socialist system replaces markets with planning, the entrepreneur with the manager, and private property is replaced by state ownership. What happens to private property right under this model obviously depends on how each country chooses to apply it. There was a Chinese version of this, a Russian version, um, I guess there's an Indian version to this, and there was a British version to this story. Historically, in some countries, the state simply confiscated private property. In others, it redistributed wealth, but capital as we knew it disappeared along with capital markets. <clears throat> so the central tenet of socialism is that the economy is centralized. The state controls production and decisions on how and what to produce and on whom is to receive that good are made by public authority rather than by privately owned and managed firms. Right? Schumpeter referred to this as the march into socialism, by he, which he meant the migration of people's economic affairs from the private to the public sphere. Right? This process was greatly accelerated in the last century by the catastrophic events of the 20th century. Two world wars, a Great Depression, hyperinflation, unemployment, so on and so forth. The third issue of capitalism is partly about the bourgeoisie themselves. Since the bourgeoisie exists only as an economic force, its social function is not as easily defensible as there was the position of the nobility under feudalism, who were born into it. The capitalist social system turns on private property Thus, under capitalism, the bourgeoisie fortress is politically defenseless and leaving it vulnerable to aggression by the working class, especially if there is rich booty to be gained. As Schumpeter said, it is possible to buy the working class off for a time, but this last resort fails as soon as the aggressor discovers that they can have it all. Faced with increasing hostility of the environment and by the legislative, administrative, and judicial practice born of the hostility of the 20th century, the world lost patience with the Enlightenment. By the early 20th century, socialism and its variants spread to most parts of the world. Capitalism, democracy, and philanthropy were rejected by nationalizing capital, replacing the markets with central planning, and exchanging democracy for totalitarianism. In effect, a new world order was put into place. Right, there was great sympathy for socialism in the United Kingdom, in the United States, especially during the Great Depression, and only a few countries stood against this Orwellian future. I remember in the 1970s as a graduate student, I guess some of you may that are old enough, we kept looking for when planning is going to take over the world, and lots of people believed that sort of this Leontief world of input-output economics and central planning would actually come to fruition before the end of the century. <clears throat> In 1942, the question of whether socialism would be democratic was a major concern, as it was clear by the time that the Communist Party in the USSR was not democratic. British socialism was expected to be more or less so, but what about the rest of the world? What would happen in Eastern and Central Europe, in China? The world was unclear about that. Now, while democracy Socialism has a certain amount of political legitimacy. Since the British Enlightenment in the 19th century, political legitimacy has driven from the, derived from the popular consent of the governed, both explicit and implicit. And any government that lacks the consent of the government is not legitimate. Right? In other words, the system needs to be democratic to be considered legitimate a condition that can be established by having codified laws, customs, etc. 
different types of legitimacy emerge in countries like Russia and China, um, but they are still viewed legitimate by their populations. So we leave this section with a question. Was Schumpeter aware of any other solution to the, to the dynamics of capitalism other than the socialist system? This is an important question because Schumpeter alluded to the problem of capitalist legitimacy. And he wrote the following. He said, referring to the entrepreneur, he says, his position as entrepreneur is essentially only a temporary one. Namely, it cannot also be transmitted by inheritance. So a successor will be unable to hold on to the social position on the, uh, unless he inherits the lion's claws along with the prey. In other words, if your children just get money, they won't be entrepreneurs and they won't be able to claim the right to be an entrepreneur that both creates wealth and also has wealth. And so for each generation, that social position needs to be reinvented. It cannot be maintained by the heirs. So let me now talk about capitalism, philanthropy, and democracy. The question today, as in 1942, is what will our future society look like? The X factor that catapulted Piketty, Capital in the 21st Century, to the bestsellers list. And be no mistake about it, we all hate Piketty. Not because of what he says, because he sold a million copies of his book. <laughs> <laughs> right. The book fed into a growing debate along the lines of the evolution of capitalism, inequality, and the concentration of wealth the prospects for future social stability. Piketty put the distribution of wealth front and center in this debate and opens a window into the future that is both brilliantly illuminating the deeply alarming for some people, the concerns with human rights, equality, and social justice. He asked a critical question. Where is the capitalist system going in the long run? The answer, according to Derber, is if we do not pursue that conversation, we may lose our hope to solve the urgent problems of extreme inequality, dynastic wealth, and democratic collapse. According to Piketty, the main drivers of inequality is the tendency of return on capital to exceed the rate of economic growth. I don't know if any of you saw news reporters putting a big R and a big G up on the screen, and then the R would get big, and then the G would get big, and the reporters would try to explain that R, which is the rate of return on capital, is about 5%, right? and the rate of growth of the economy is about 2%, and wages never go faster than the economy. So as long as R is greater than G, inequality will continue into perpetuity. Now, of course, every economist loved this debate, and they all said, oh, Piketty is wrong, and for lots of reasons, right? He misrepresented how G is measured. He doesn't understand how R is measured. He tries to come up with laws of capitalism that um, Asimogo said don't exist. Others, like Soskic, my colleague at LSE, argued that he used mathematics, and you can't explain social science with mathematics. I guess some of us would disagree with that. Um, in a nutshell, they all argued that he really missed everything. However, I would argue that these critics are actually wrong, and if capitalism is an evolutionary process, there are certain general laws and institutions that help explain what moves the system forward. In fact, it's been around for 300 years, and to argue that there are no laws that govern it, I think, is beside the point. 
the critics aside, I think to understand Piketty, I think he is right about the laws and about the building blocks of society. But I think they're different than his laws. Right? The building blocks of modern society are capitalism, philanthropy, and democracy. Democracy goes back to the 5th century BC. I think it's right before Christ. Um, in the 17th century, the West invented capitalism. And there was a big debate whether it was the 16th century or the 17th and what role the Dutch played in it and what role the British. But it's in that general time frame. Right? This brought us the Industrial Revolution, innovation, technology, and jobs for millions. However, the institutional structure that sustains this development was much broader and has its roots much further back. Philanthropy is old as Rome itself. Right? The concept of moral capital emerges in the 19th century. While capitalism is governed primarily by the market system and democracy, by the political process, philanthropy is to a large degree independent of both forces right? and is a part of human nature. Nevertheless, it also reinforces and nurtures both by relying on the better side of our humanity. But how can philanthropy be part of capitalism? Capitalism, as Max Weber taught us, showed is a relatively orderly system of institutions and incentives governed by the tractical logic of supply and demand. Philanthropy, by contrast, lacks a set of laws to explain its ebbs and flows. Philanthropy is subject to the whims of the wealthy and the not so wealthy, like the royal art patrons from European history. Furthermore, philanthropy is not only largely ungoverned by economic principles, it is also relatively free of the checks and balances found in democracy, such as elections and referendum. The answer to this puzzle is to be found in the writings of the moral philosopher Adam Smith, who wrote, there are evidently some principles of man's nature which interest him in the fortunes of others and renders their happiness necessary to him. Philanthropy is governed by natural principles and embedded altruism why capitalism is governed by culture and institutions. While philanthropy has been loyal to the institutions of capitalism, it is rarely considered intertwined with capitalism, even though it both emanates from and continually nurtures the capitalist system. This invisible, underappreciated force for progress within advanced capitalism is the secret ingredient that fails to get mentioned in economic accounts of, accounts of capitalism like Piketty's capital. Philanthropy does not interfere with the dynamics of capitalism. Individuals are free to accumulate capital, and because the growing rate of the economy is not compromised with taxes, the capital income ratio can rise in the long run. I have argued that philanthropy propels the basic machinery of capitalism along with government and taxes. Therefore, in addition to well-functioning markets, property rights, contract law, capital markets, and the, and the like, philanthropy, a little understood economic force, provides an institutional element that promotes the vital non-monetary institutional forces needed to achieve growth through technological innovation, thereby promote equality of opportunity and cultivate economic security. Philanthropy as an institution directly alters the ownership of capital and the allocation of income in the capitalist system. It can do this in partnership with government, and in fact it works best when government and philanthropy work hand in hand. So how does philanthropy solve the Piketty conundrum? The answer is rather simple. By increasing the growth rate of the economy, G, to mitigate the difference between 
R and G, or the rate of return on capital and the growth rate, and reduce the share of income going to the owners of capital. Thinking of the two laws together, the aim is to maintain the, the, the dynamics of the system, or efficiency, while solving rising income inequality. <clears throat> this is done in part by increasing growth G and reducing the share of capital going to the rich while maintaining a high rate of return. So therefore, the focus is on the capital income ratio. Philanthropy focuses on the stock of wealth and not on the flow of income. And it does not affect the stock of capital, but redirects the flow of income to opportunity creating activities. In other words, by turning a share of capital into moral capital, philanthropy reduces the size of R and increases the growth rate of the economy, therefore solving the Piketty conundrum. So for wealth to invigorate the capital system, it needs to be kept in rotation like the planets around the sun. Philanthropy strengthens capitalism in three ways, right? First, when targeted toward universities, research, and other productive uses, philanthropy lays the groundwork for new cycles of innovation and enterprise. Second, philanthropy strengthens capitalism by providing a mechanism for dismantling wealth accumulated in the past and reinvesting it to, for, for the entrepreneurial potential of the future. When philanthropy is absent, capital remains concentrated, rent-seeking flourishes, and innovation and entrepreneurship suffer. In other words, monopoly spreads. Finally, philanthropy strengthens the legitimacy of the system because the, functioning of, because the function of the entrepreneur cannot be passed along through inheritance. Philanthropy gives legitimacy to the bourgeoisie by reconstituting private wealth to create public goods and creating opportunities for new entrepreneurs. In the founding document of the Marshall Institute for Philanthropy and Social Entrepreneurship at the London School of Economics, your partners, Sir Thomas Hughes Hallett wrote, private contributions to the public good of time, talent, and treasure will be the crucial ingredients of a successful society and a new or more responsible model of capitalism. A few years ago, as I was, I was trying to get a better understanding of, of advanced capitalism, I wrote in the American interest that the essence of advanced capitalism today is not an iron triangle that balances the interests of large corporations, organized labor, with the active involvement of government. Nor is it a free-for-all in which the interests of the many are readily subsumed by the acquisitive appetite of the few. Rather, advanced capitalism is a dynamic process that balances wealth and opportunity. Rather, I'm sorry, that balances wealth and opportunity which I called the great seesaw of civilization. It follows that the success of advanced capitalism must turn not on its transient ability to generate macroeconomic growth, but on its sustained ability to generate microeconomic opportunity. The forces of capitalism, philanthropy, and democracy need to be woven together into a global system of equality of opportunity and prosperity for all. The central mission of globalization <clears throat> is to help make social sustainability a reality. We need to establish a dialogue for action. Pope Francis challenged the US Congress a few days ago to break out of its cycle of polarization and paralysis to finally help he heal the open wounds of the planet torn apart, par <coughs> torn apart by greed, poverty, and pollution. We need to bring the cultural, natural, and institutions of humanity together to ensure our social survival 
through and beyond the 21st century. While many look to government as the solution to our conundrum and others espouse the free market, I suggest that philanthropy holds the key to our future. Philanthropy has long been a distinctive feature of American capitalism, but its crucial role in the economic well-being of the nation and the world remain largely unexplored. Let me now turn to two shorter issues, questions. And the question is, what does the ecosystem of moral capital look like? Now, I don't know what the ecosystem is, but all of you know ecosystem is everywhere today, so it's a useful way to think about this. And let me say there are four elements to this ecosystem. Opportunity, entrepreneurship and innovation, wealth creation, and philanthropy. And think of these as four balls that are up in the air being juggled. And I like to think of these four balls as currents, right? like currents of an ocean that are continually shifting and shaping the landscape. Neither one of them is dominant at any one time. They operate differently over time, but they continually shift and alter the way in which this ecosystem works. If you think of what this ecosystem has done, right, it has created over the years a large, functioning, highly successful society both in Western Europe, now in Asia, and spreading around the world. Um, and so this then brings us to the next question, right? What is missing from this story is government. And when I wrote my book, I actually left government out on purpose because I was trying to isolate how these currents actually interacted. And so there was a lot of criticism. Well, what about government? Doesn't government play that central role of creating opportunity, promoting innovation? Um, and so if you think of it, indeed, if you think of these four balls, government is at the center. Right? And government plays an important role in this. Um, but it leads to the question, what actually is the role of government in this ecosystem? How large is it? How large should it be? And what is its effective role? Right? And then one answer to this is that government is most effective when it sets the rules of the game with respect to how we navigate the economic currents, both nationally and internationally. Right? So is that ball larger or smaller? Now, government really does four things. Right? It plays a direct role in creating opportunity through education, healthcare, and infrastructure. We know this. Right? Second, it does not play a direct role in innovation, although there are some out there that think that government is more innovative than business. Third, government plays an important role in wealth. Right? It plays a role in whether you can keep wealth, whether it's taxed away, whether you should let you keep it. Government has rules on this that reflect, to some extent, society's wishes. And finally, the government interacts with philanthropy and charity. Right? Over the years, especially since the Second World War, the government has taken over many functions, once provided by charity, um, as we hear it at the last lecture, <coughs> certainly in health care, education, and the arts. What does the Piketty world look like? The Piketty world can be very interestingly explained here. There's a large ball for opportunity, a large ball for innovation, 
a large ball for a capital, there's almost no ball for philanthropy or social capital. As indeed as Piketty writes, he says social capital solves nothing. And government then plays a much larger role and all the currents flow through opportunity, innovation, capital, and government. So let me come to the last piece of this story. Can we measure moral capital? That's a great issue. We can measure opportunity. Certainly if we use education as a proxy. We can measure entrepreneurship. In fact, I have an index that measures that globally. And I think we have a reasonable way of measuring how much entrepreneurship and innovation we have. And recently, we've had better data on wealth. Who owns it? How much? In fact, there's a new research topic on billionaires that is emerging, thanks to our friends at Forbes magazine. However, data on moral capital is pretty elusive. We have data on volunteerism, which is an aspect of giving. Right? We have some data on charity. But what is the size of moral capital is relatively elusive. So a few years ago, I started trying to put some numbers together and looking at what sectors would we even measure. A and it's actually not hard to figure out. If we look at education, the universities, foundations, and churches, in them, we can try to put together the building blocks of moral capital. So not trying to go to any other country and try to explain to them how their system works. So when I look at the United States, we can put some numbers together. It's actually rather interesting. If we look at the universities, and if we just look at the top 25 universities in the United States, and you know all of their names, right, from Harvard, Yale, to Brown. Um, and if we look at their endowments, their assets, and their total assets, these 25 schools have $500 billion in moral capital, half a trillion dollars. If we add to that the rest of the institutions which is a much harder number because now I have to look at thousands of schools, I think we come up with about a trillion dollars in moral capital in the universities. If we look at the largest foundations in the United States, and to some extent some of them globally, there's about another trillion dollars in foundations. The church is tricky. I don't, and, and no, nobody really has a good balance sheet that is exultant. Here's what's in the Mormon church, right? So looking around, I think there's about $2 trillion in the churches in the United States. Um, well, if you add that up, you come up with about $5 trillion. So then the next question is, what is the size of the capital stock? Well, that's an easy number because even the economist has that. It's about $50 trillion. So if there's $5 trillion of moral capital in the US, the capital stock is 50, um, arithmetic tells me it's about 10%. Very interesting number. As a high end. So let's assume that it's only half of that. Then it would be 5%. So moral capital in the United States is somewhere between probably $5 trillion or 5% to 10% of capital. Right? So the interest from that in the dividends flow to opportunity creation. So if we look at the world today, how large is moral capital globally? It's harder to measure, but we know this. The global capital stock is $200 trillion. So three quarters of the capital stock is outside the United States. Right? One quarter is in the United States. 
So if we apply this 10% measure, moral capital should be about $20 trillion. But we know it's nowhere near that, right? Outside the United States, it's a relatively small amount. So while three quarters of the capital is outside the United States, three quarters of the moral capital is inside the United States. So that gives us some perspective on the size of capital, what it looks like, and how to think about it. So, so let me summarize. Um, I'm going to make two points. Um, right, as we're now 15 years into the 21st century, we are on the first steps of the great rebuilding of the institutional structure of global capitalism. This is debated, little understood, and there are two real issues that emerge. Right? And the first one is, what does social sustainability look like globally in the 21st century? Is it an American model adapted around the world? Is it a European model with the EU as the blueprint? Is it a Chinese model with some mixture of communism and capitalism? Or is it an Indian model? I don't think we know the answer to this. This is a research question. Right? The second big issue every ta everyone talks about is environmental sustainability. Um, well, there's no undergraduate that doesn't think about this and debate it. But I'm not sure if the social sustainability issue is not even larger than our environmental sustainability issue because it's actually at the heart of what the social structure looks like in the 21st century. So how will the currents of capitalism wash ashore in the next decade or two? The simple answer to this question is that moral capital will continue to shape the world. Why? Because that is what human nature is about, and it is human nature that will shape the course of history. Thank you.